Good morning. <coughs> Let's begin our celebration this morning in the Lord's name, who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. May the grace and peace of God our Father, the love of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you. And now as we begin our celebration, hear our opening words, send out your light and your truth, Lord, and let them lead us on. Let them bring us to your holy mountain, to your new and glorious dwelling. Then we will go to the altar of God, the God who gives us exceeding joy. And we will praise you upon the harp, O God, our saving God. Please enjoy our prelude music.
I'd like to welcome everyone back again to our celebration online of the Lord's Supper and of course for our Sunday worship. Uh, thank you for being here. As I've said before, and I will say again now, you make us the church because the church is nothing other than a gathering of believers who love and support each other. And, and that is indeed what we are trying to be uh, even on the internet. So thanks be to God for Zoom and for all the tools of technology that allow us week after week to gather in this way so that we can remind ourselves of who we are because we are in fact children of God. We are in fact children of the light. Jesus has told us that we must be the light of the world and so we must be. And so thank you for helping us to be a community of believers. Thank you for being light in the world. And, and thank you for letting your light shine in the darkness because there is so much of it. Um, please enjoy now our sung call to worship. God's Law from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore encourage one another with these words. There ain't 
no room for the hopeless sinner who would hurt all mankind just to save his own. Have pity on those whose chances grow thinner, for there's no hiding place against the kingdom's throne. So people get ready for the train is coming. You don't need no baggage, you just get on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. You don't need no ticket, you just thank the Lord. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has called us to live in righteousness. He calls us to live in right relationship with each other. And, and he calls us to, to bless each other and take care of each other. And we often fail to do that. But when we do, when we fall short of God's will for us and for our lives, Jesus is always calling us to return knowing that we will always find forgiveness and love with him. And so please uh, let's together bring our, our prayers of confession before God and before each other so that we can hear again the assurance that Jesus forgives and loves and restores each one of us. Loving God, we confess that we have sinned against you by not honoring you or loving one another. When we ignore injustice in the world, our worship brings you no delight. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. Make haste to help us that we may stand in right relationship with you and the whole of your creation and sing your praises through the mercy of Christ, our resurrected Savior. Amen. Amen. Rejoice and be glad, for our God is mighty to save. Give thanks that we are the chosen, beloved, and forgiven children of God. And so be assured that whatever your shortfalls or mine might be, whatever our sins, whatever our mistakes, we have brought them and placed them before the cross of Christ this morning, and they are forgiven. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself. And he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us for the forgiveness of sin. And so through the ministry of our church, we have pardon and peace in the name of the one God who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And now please exchange some sign of that peace if you're with people, just do what comes naturally. And if you're all by yourself, Please take this moment as we listen to our, our song of peace. Please take this moment to pray for peace in our nation, in our world, in our communities, in our families, in our churches. Uh, peace all around us because peace is the will of God. No, no.
prayer for illumination. Send your Spirit to move in our world and stir the water of our souls that we may desire a word of instruction that awakens us to the joy of your coming reign. Amen. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. Wisdom is radiant and unfading, and she is easily discerned by those who love her and is found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known to those who desire her. One who rises early to seek her will have no difficulty, for she will be found sitting at the gate. To fix one's thought on her is perfect understanding, and one who is vigilant on her account would soon be free from care, because she goes about seeking those worthy of her. And she graciously appears to them in their paths and meets them in every thought. The beginning of wisdom is the most sincere desire for instruction and concern for instruction is love of her. And love of her is the keeping of her laws and giving heed to her laws is assurance of immortality and immortality brings one near to God. So the desire for wisdom leads to a kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And this is the word of the Lord.
Let's pray. Creator God, fill us with your Holy Spirit and inspire us to, to having heard your word proclaimed, inspire us to live as faithful children of the light. We ask this in Jesus' name. He is the one who calls us and he is faithful and he is Lord with you forever and ever. And we can all say amen. There's a story I've heard about a Irish priest back in the old country. And father had a bit of a problem with the creature, if you know what I mean. He would go to the pub and have a pop or two too many. And many is the morning that he would wake up with a hangover. Well, on this particular morning, not unlike many others, uh, the good father got up and bleary-eyed, he splashed some water on his face. He brushed his teeth. He hoped the headache would go away quickly. And he looked out his window down the main street of his village. And what do you think he saw? He saw the Lord himself walking straight towards his residence. Now, that sobered him up very, very quickly, and he didn't know what to do because this was completely unexpected. You see, you do not know the day nor the hour. In the gospel today, Jesus has finished with his... With his uh, controversies with the scribes and the Pharisees and, the, and, and the, the priests and the Levites, the folks up on Temple Mount, and he's left the temple and he's with his disciples and they're admiring the temple and on the way from the temple, he says, well, you think that's a, that's a beautiful temple, don't you? Well, let me tell you something. The day is coming when not a stone will be left upon a stone. And then he begins what they call the apocalyptic discourse. He talks about the end of things. You see, a, a people who have lost hope or who have been oppressed, they turn outside of themselves for help. They look for God to come from outside of history, smash their enemies, and vindicate them. And that's what apocalyptic literature says. It says God is ultimately going to win the day, and it's going to be God's victory. So Jesus, walking from the temple, he says, well, you know, the temple, you think you can put your eggs in the temple basket? The temple is going to be so gone that you won't be able to find two stones that are left on top of each other. That's how thoroughly it will be destroyed. The temple of, 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 of Herod was a magnificent building. It had huge blocks at its foundation that weighed thousands of tons I think it was thousands of tons. The, the gold plate on the face of the temple was so bright that the ancient historians said you couldn't look at it during, during the time that the sun was shining on it because your eyes couldn't continue to watch it. That's how bright it was. That magnificent building, Jesus says, it's going to be gone. Not one stone left upon another. That caught their attention. So, so he begins to say, the, the, the end is going to come like this. There will be conflict among nations. Terrible conflict among nations. Peoples turning against each other. Sound like anything you know today? He says, there'll be persecutions. Terrible persecutions. Well, at the time that Matthew wrote this gospel, there were terrible persecutions. Folks, you want to know something? There are terrible persecutions today. In France, last year, there were more than a thousand attacks on Christians within Christian churches alone. Last week, or was it the week before, three, two women and a sacristan were murdered inside a church, the Basilica of, of, of Notre Dame, in Nice, one of the women was beheaded. It was an act of Islamic terrorism. But persecution, you think this was a, that was a time of the past? It's all around. Christians are persecuted in China. Pre Christians are persecuted in, 
in, in North Korea. Christians are persecuted in Africa. Christians are persecuted in France. Christians are persecuted here. There have been many attacks on Christian churches and Jewish synagogues and, and mosques as well. There have been attacks on people of faith throughout this country. Persecutions are all around us. Jesus is not talking about something that is beyond our ability to comprehend. He says there'll be sacrilege. Places of God will be desecrated. Well, isn't that happening today too? Isn't it happening when an artist puts a crucifix in a, in a cup of urine and calls it art? Isn't it happening when, when statues at Catholic churches are, are vandalized and, and some beheaded? There is sacrilegious action in our world right now. In China, Chinese churches, th those that were even allowed to exist, were forced to take the crosses off their steeples because that offended the state. Jesus says, when the end is coming, there will be conflict among nations, there will be persecutions, and there will be sacrilege. He said, and when you see that, then know that the Son of Man is coming. See, and that's what apocalyptic aim, aims at. That's what, that's, that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that the problems of this world are such that this world can't solve them. But that God will come in God's good time and vindicate his people because when the Son of Man comes, what comes with him? Justice. What comes with him? The vindication of his people. What comes with him? Judgment of those who have betrayed him and their vocation as images of God. And so Jesus says, this is all coming when you see these signs. Because when the fig tree is in blossom, you know what season it is. And when these things start happening, you know what's coming next. Well, this got their attention. And they, uh, the disciples said, well, Lord, when's this going to happen? And, and um, how will we you know, be able to respond? And Jesus says, no one knows. He said, I don't even know. Only the Father knows. This is God's timing, and it's not given to us to know. And so what we need to do is always be prepared for the coming of Christ. Always. Every day. Don't be caught with a hangover in your residence, looking down the street when Jesus is walking towards you. No. Be ready for him. So what, what Jesus does after this discourse and after telling his disciples that, that he can't tell them the precise time, but he can tell them the signs of what's leading up to it. And it, By the way, they're the signs that we have all around us in the world. He, he gives them three parables of readiness. And the one that Steve read today is, is, is one of those three parables. It's a parable about ten maidens who are attendants at a wedding. Now let's, let's look at the context. Because weddings were big deals. In, in, in Jesus' time, they could, they could go on for more than a week. The, the wine flowed freely. The entire village was involved. It was, it was a wonderful, it was a joyous thing. It was, it was something of joy that the people could remember at a time when there wasn't much joy in their lives. So they looked forward to weddings. And the wedding started when the, bride took the, when the groom took the bride from her father's house into the, their new home together. And that would happen after he had negotiated the, the ketubah, the wedding contract. And Jews still use a ketubah today. They're beautiful things. Um, but essentially, the, the father of the, of the bride is arranging 
for the for for the the the, the groom to accept his daughter, the, the father's daughter, as, as the groom's spouse. And there are protections for the daughter in that ketubah. They're, they're beautiful, they're truly beautiful things. But, but there are negotiations as well, because there's, there's a, a trace of the old dowry in them. So, you know, you, I'll give you my daughter, you give me, uh, you know, 20 goats and a couple of cows, and we'll call it a day. So there's this, this negotiation, and sometimes the negotiation goes on for a while. So you never know exactly when the groom and the bride are coming back to, the, to their new home. And, but when they do, there are attendants ready to light the way with torches. And that's what these women were. They were waiting for the bride and the groom to come home so they could start the party. They're waiting for something magnificent. But they don't know exactly when it happens because the timing depends on, on the negotiation for the ketubah. So in Jesus' story, the, the, the negotiation obviously goes on longer than expected, and the bridesmaids are waiting and waiting and waiting, and they lose their edge. They stop watching. Every one of the ten of them falls asleep. But half of them, five of them, they fall asleep, but they have enough oil to keep their lamps burning, where five do not. And that's the heart of the story, because Jesus says the bridegroom comes home very late, very late, because you don't know when he's coming. And when he's coming, the cry goes out, and the attendants have to go out and be ready, be ready with their light. And if you're out of oil, you have no light. And that's the situation that five of these bridesmaids are in. Now, Jesus doesn't, doesn't tell us this story, tell his disciples this story, because he's interested in training them for, for weddings. He tells them this because it's an analogy. He tells them this because he is the bridegroom. And his people are the bride. And... The light of the attendants is the light in the world as we wait for him to come in glory. And he says, keep your light burning. Stay ready and watchful. He says, you don't know the day nor the hour. And there's a little bit of good news in the story for all of us who like fall asleep sometimes. And that is that everybody, all of these women fell asleep. Every last one of them. But that was okay because they had taken preparations. There was enough oil to keep their light burning. And I think when we think about these lights that the women are carrying, we're the light bearers. Jesus says, we're the light of the world. He says, light, let your light shine before men so that they may give glory to God. Not glory to you, glory to God. And so what Jesus is saying is, maybe we'll doze a little. Maybe we'll slip into some of the practices of the world, and that's not a great thing. That's like falling asleep. But we have to be ready with light. And what does it mean to be ready? It means to have put aside the things of this world. Paul says to the Colossians, she says, you're the light. Put aside things of darkness. Put aside anger and malice and hatred. Don't do that stuff anymore. We are living in a world that is so dark because people are constantly angry and self-serving and selfish and grasping. And that is the way of this world. Paul says, put it aside. Put it aside and instead put on Christ. We are ready and we have our oil in our lamps if we have put on Christ. What does that look like? He says, 
Put on compassion. He says this to the Colossians, right in the end, chapter 4. Put on compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Just, let's go over his list. Put on compassion and kindness. So many in our world, so many of us are so interested in what we want and what we get and what we have that we forget that true Christianity, true humanity made in the image of God is not getting, but it's giving. God is the, the one who is generous out of nothing. In his generosity, he creates everything you see around you. So, he's, so Paul says, put on the things of light. Act more like God and less like, like fallen humanity. And be compassionate and kind. Who is it around you who needs your kindness? I mean, it, it, with a little creativity, you can find people every day, multiple times. You can find them on the streets. You can find them in your families. You can find them in your neighborhoods. Who needs your compassion? Who's lost a loved one and could use a telephone call? Who is struggling with some problem and needs a listening ear? Not advice, a listening ear. Who needs to hear you say, I understand you? And it's okay for you to be you, even if you're struggling. Put on, Paul says, compassion and kindness. Be humble. Humility, rooted in the Latin word, which means soil, which is the, the source of all life and growth. Humility recognizes who we really are. We are really nothing without God. And so when we put on humility, we acknowledge that. We acknowledge that we need to be grateful for every single breath we take. For every bite of food we eat. How many of us are, are conscientious, even at home, even alone, of gracing our meals, of saying thanks over, over a nice meal, Thank you, Lord, because this bounty of your earth is mine because you love me. And, and, and thank you for the farmers and thank you for the truckers and thank you for the grocers. Thank you for everyone who has made this meal in my house and home possible. He says, be meek. We have too many bulldogs and not enough pussycats. I'm sorry. I love animals. Be meek and gentle. The world needs that. It doesn't need harshness. It doesn't need bullying. It needs gentle kindness. And that's what meekness is. Be patient, Paul says. Patience is the gift you give another. And maybe it's the gift you give yourself, too, of saying it's okay to be at, going at the speed you're going at. You don't have to adjust your timing to my needs. How many of us get so impatient because patience really is, is a form of selfishness, right? We're, we're just driving behind a slow driver and we're, we're, we're impatient. We want to get past them. You know, it's okay to drive slowly. It's okay to, for, for people to be old and a little frightened of the roads. It's okay for us to slow down and show someone else that we don't want to rush them that we can take whatever we're going to and, and relax about it because we'll get to it when we get to it. The, the agenda of God is sometimes dis, uh, discoverable in, in the slowness of others. So give them a break. Paul says, forgive. He said, as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you forgive each other. See, we tend to hold on to the offenses against us because, I mean, how dare anybody offend us? And it's very personal, right? So there's, there's an offense to the justice in the universe. Paul says, let go of that. What, what, what does it win you? I mean, when you are holding on to anger and bitterness, you are just poisoning your own life. 
So he says, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Don't forget how much you've been forgiven. Don't forget every single false step you've taken that the Lord has understood and, and forgiven you and allowed you to have yet another day and breath of life. As the Lord has forgiven us with generosity, so we must forgive each other with generosity. And then St. Paul, Paul says, and above all these things put on love, which binds everything together in perfect unity. And he uses the word uh, agape, uh, a love that's selfless, a love that's active, a love that does and doesn't just think. So he says, he says love, go, go out in your world and actively love people. That's what keeping your oil ready and your lamps burning looks like. It's living every day like that and not ever forgetting that as we live that way, we are waiting for the Lord to come and he will come. He comes every day. So one of the things we can do every day is watch for him. Be watchful, Jesus says. You don't know the day nor the hour. Every day, and in many of the hours of those days, Jesus comes. He comes to us in a hopeless man or, or a child in need of help. He comes to us in a colleague who's confused. He comes to us in our spouses and in our children and in the people we love and who love us. He comes to us and we find his love in their love. We find his love in their need. We find him and his presence in them if we are watching. And if we miss him, think of how much we've missed. And then of course, one of the points that Jesus makes in this parable is we have time but we don't have all the time in the world because a time will come when there is no more time. The time will come when, it, it, when if you don't have oil in your lamp, if you're not being the light of the world, the party's going to start and you're not going to be there. And the door will close and when you knock on it, Jesus will say, I assure you, I do not know you. And that door closes a couple of times. It certainly will close at the end of time when the Lord comes with the angels and the, his glory and makes a new heaven and a new earth and there's the final vindication of his people and the final judgment and all that sort of stuff. That's coming. We don't know the day nor the hour. But we all die too, you know? Every one of us. I'm going to die. You're going to die. We're all going to die. And in that moment, the door also closes. Whatever it means to be light in the world, we can't be it any longer. Whatever it means to have oil in our lamp, we can't get it anymore when that door of life closes in death or when he comes in glory to judge us all. And so, Jesus says, be ready. Be ready every minute. Be ready every second. Start the day with readiness. Get, get it in your mindset that he is coming today. He's coming today to visit you in some form. He's coming one day to take you home. And he's coming one day to create a new heaven and a new earth. I assure you, every one of those days will come. But we need to be ready on all of them, on every last one of them. When the old Irish priest saw Jesus walking down the main street of his village right towards the priest's residence, he sobered up quickly. He ran to his telephone and he called his bishop. He got the bishop on the phone and he said, Bishop, I've got a problem here. He said, the Lord himself is is walking down the main street of me, of me village. What should I do? And the bishop's response was, if I were you, I'd try to look busy. We need to get busy. We need to get busy being the light of the world. Amen. Keep your lamp.
whole church, we, we affirm, affirm that, that we are made in God's image, image befriended by, by Christ, Christ, empowered by the Spirit, Spirit, with people everywhere. We, we affirm God's, God's goodness at the heart of humanity, humanity planted more deeply than all that is wrong. With all creation, we, we celebrate the miracle and wonder of life, the unfolding purposes of God forever at work in ourselves and the world. Let us offer our prayers of petition and, and thanksgiving to the God who always hears our prayers and who answers and responds to us with love and with power. Our response is, God of all goodness, hear our prayer. We pray for all who seek your radiant light in the darkened corners of our world, May we find our way to you through our love for one another. God, God of all goodness, goodness, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are oppressed by institutions and structures unjustly ordered. Bless us with a joy for justice that all may share in the blessings of this life, walking in right relationship with you by caring for our neighbor. God, God of all goodness, goodness hear, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for all who have no work, for those without adequate health care, and for all who hunger or have no shelter. Bless us with meaningful work and ample provision as we love and care for each other under the protection of your sheltering sky. God of all goodness, hear our prayer. We pray for all who suffer violence on dangerous streets and in war-torn places. Keep them from harm's way. Bless us with your vision of peace that all may flourish as one family under God with justice and freedom for all. God of all goodness, hear our prayer. For our nation and for all who have been elected to office, whether high or low, guide them with your spirit of wisdom, always to act with integrity and according to your will and plan. God of all goodness, hear our prayer. For those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, comfort them in their need and help those who care for them. Teach us to bear the burdens of our sisters and brothers with humility. For the sick and those in distress, God of all goodness, hear our prayer. We pray for the health and safety of all medical professionals, especially Dr. Donna McNamara, Dr. Kevin Frisson, Dr. John Thorndike and his wife, Dr. Tara Shatzel hill and Dr. Mark C. Johnson. And for our nurses, Mertella Monroe, Alexandra Woodruff and her husband, Dmitry Shemkolovich, Carla Quinlan, Paula Snyder, Peg Cornell, Andy Strangey, Libby Black, Jill Felter, Claudia Winger, and Mary Lou Prinzivali. God, God of all goodness, goodness hear, hear our prayer. prayer for the intentions of our congregation. 
God of all goodness, hear our prayer. Creator God, bless each one of us with the sure and certain knowledge of our salvation. Give us the grace to see your action in our world, not only hearing our prayers, but answering them with your power. And where we do not see, give us the eyes and the heart of faith to know that you are with us and you abide with us and protect us to the end of the ages. We pray in Jesus' name through the power of the Spirit. With you, they are one God forever and ever, and we can all say, Amen. And now as children of God, children of the one Father of us all, as brothers and sisters to each other, for that is what we are. That is the unity that transcends all diversity and division. That is the one thing that we have in common that makes us one and unites us to each other is so deeply and at such a profoundly beautiful level that nothing should be able to divide us. Not politics, not, not theories, not, not race, not creed. Nothing should divide us because we are united by the love of God. And so as one family, as brothers and sisters, we pray to our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And we can all say, Amen. And now we are going to, to take up our virtual collection. And it is my hope that in some ways you will, you will find a way to give uh, generously to this church. And I ask that in part because, yes, I want to keep the lights on and the heat running. Uh, but more profoundly than that, people come to us and they ask for our help. And we try to give it to them. We are a very generous church. Honest to God, we are but we can't be generous unless you are generous to us. So your generosity really is, is your participation in the loving ministry of this church, which touches and blesses so many. So please, as we listen to the offertory hymn, uh, please uh, ask God how he would like you to be generous to us. And then please either write a check and stick it in the mail or um, give online, it's very easy. I do that every week myself. Uh, but find some way to be generous to this generous church. And if you can't, and I understand that some people just can't, and if you're in need of anything, please let us know. Call me, call one of the elders, call one of the deacons, call somebody, uh, stop by. Uh, but let us know and we will do everything we can to address your need and to help you. Thank you.
great and loving God, we give you thanks that you have given your faithful people a love for justice and the gift of generosity. Creator God, we give you thanks because you give us the gift of being able to give back to you what you have first given to us. And so now we ask you to bless the offerings of this people, your people, and take these offerings and make them signs of faithfulness. And in the hands of this church, let them go to the building of your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. He is your son, and he is our brother forever and ever. And we can all say, amen. And now we're about to celebrate the Lord's Supper. I have bread and I have wine in front of me. I hope that you have the same in front of you. And if, if you don't, take a moment and get it. Uh, if you'd like to receive communion, because we are about to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And this is as much the Lord's Supper in your home as it would have been in this room had we all been present. This is the way God gives us to continue to have the meal that nourishes his people. And so it is very important that we continue to, to eat and drink and remember as Christ has commanded us to. And that's what we're about to do. So please uh, get your bread, your wine, your juice, and, and celebrate with us uh, the great meal of our salvation. So may the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, O God, through your beloved servant, Christ Jesus, our Lord, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ was born of Mary and shared our human nature. With loving arms outstretched upon the cross for us, Jesus broke the chains of evil and destruction. By his resurrection, your will was fulfilled and you gathered a holy people to offer you praise. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim your glory as we sing. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Christ Jesus, your Son, our Lord, in whom your fullness dwells. You sent him to us to be the way, the truth, and the life. Revealing your love, Jesus taught those who would hear him. He healed those who believed in him. He received all who sought him and lifted the burden of their sin. We glorify you for your great power at work in our Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us new by water and the Holy Spirit. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, eat. This is my body, which will be given up for you. And when the supper was over, he took the cup full of wine. Again, he gave you thanks and praise, gave the cup to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all so that sin may be forgiven.
Whenever you do these things, do them in memory of me. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Christ Jesus. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim the crucified and risen one. Great is the mystery of our faith and we proclaim it. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be our communion in the body and blood of Christ. By your spirit, unite us with the living Christ and all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one as he prayed that we would be one. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Help us, O oh God, to love as Christ loved. Knowing our own weakness, may we stand with all who stumble. Sharing in his suffering, may we remember all who suffer. Held in his love, may we embrace all whom the world denies. Rejoicing in his forgiveness, may we forgive all who sin against us. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all ages, we will feast with you at the table of your glory. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Blessing, honor, and glory be yours here and everywhere, now and forever. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So as you, as you take this bread and as you take this wine and as you, as you eat and drink as he commanded, remember that this bread and this wine reveals us to ourselves. We are the body of Christ. We are his blood. We are his spirit and energy in the world. We are the ones sent to be the light of the world until he comes again. And so be what you behold and behold who you are. May the body and blood of Christ bring all of us who receive it to life that knows no end.
You said take this cup of sacrifice It represents my blood which gives you new life Oh, in this upper room We gladly feast with you Committing of our service back to you Let us pray. Great and loving God, your wisdom is radiant and unfading, easily discerned by all who seek your way. When faithful men and women live in love and work for justice, heaven breaks into earth. Give us the grace to live confidently and expectantly, trusting that the Lord of history who has been approaching from all eternity, comes into life continuously, continuously with compassion, redemption, and hope, and comes at the end of time to call and restore all things to himself. Amen. Sisters and brothers, be swift to listen, make haste to be kind, let justice roll down like waters of righteousness, like an ever-flowing stream. May God who creates, redeems, and sustains keep you in fervent love and prayer and hope. Please bow down your heads to pray for God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face to you and have mercy on you. May the Lord show you kindness and give you peace. May the Lord bless each one of us. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And now go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to walk with him in Jerusalem, just as John did. Amen. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in. Just like John, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem. Just like John. Oh, John, oh, John, what do you say? To walk in Jerusalem. Just like John. And I'll be there at the coming day. To walk in just like John, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem. Just like John. John said the city was just four square. To walk in Jerusalem. Just like John. And he declared he'd meet me there. To walk in Jerusalem. Just like John. When Peter was preaching at Pentecost. To walk in Jerusalem, just, just like John. He was in doubt with the Holy Ghost. To walk in Jerusalem, just like John. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem, just like John. I want to be ready. I want to be ready, I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem, sing in Jerusalem, shout in Jerusalem, just like John.